today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom, and I'm joined today by myeloma friends, including Pat Killingsworth, Jack Ayalos, and Cynthia Chimlowski as co-hosts. This is the last in a very important series featuring the Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative, and wow, it's been an amazing few months. For this new initiative, we created an expert scientific advisory board, then invited well-educated patient advocates to create the first patient advisory board. This is really the first time that a group of patients have been involved in voting on research that could potentially be funded. As a group, we decided to select projects for high-risk myeloma because these patients are out of options, and for them, the current drugs, um, some of them are not working. Because we know that we all become high risk at some point in our disease, we know that hitting the most critical target will provide benefit for us all, and we've now heard how these projects could equally benefit low risk and even smoldering myeloma patients. We called for letters of intent and received 36 high quality proposals from top investigators around the world. Our scientific advisory board then scored these proposals and selected a top 10. This show is the last of the 10, and after the shows are complete and full proposals have been submitted, both the Scientific Advisory Board and the Patient Advisory Board will vote to select a limited number of proposals to fund. Now, part of our very important message is that patients can and should do more than patiently wait for a cure. As Pat is fond of saying, we are in myeloma time and need solutions now rather than later. We need you to be involved, and today we have a very simple way for you to help do just that. Every myeloma patient, every everyone diagnosed, has a community of friends and family who want to love and support and help them, but sometimes don't know how. Today, you can go to http colon forward slash forward slash mcri.mylomacrow.org and notice there's no www to create your own fundraising page. Once you get to that link, you can click on build a team. You can upload your own photo and write your own text to customize your page. We're going to wait to ask you to share that page with your family and friends when we know which projects we will be funding, but you can take 10 minutes today and get that done so we are all ready to go. There's no way that we can do this without you, and we are the ones for whom it matters most. As Gary said in the video, if you watch that on that link as well, this is a way that we can cure ourselves. So we are very privileged and honored today to have with us two doctors, Dr. Fritz von Rie of UAMS and Dr. Stephen Russell of the Mayo Clinic. So welcome, doctors. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for inviting us. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so valuable for patients to listen directly from the researchers themselves as they describe the research, um, how it operates, and what it's what they're trying to accomplish. Before we get started, let me uh, introduce you both. Dr. Von Rie is a professor of medicine and director of clinical research with the Myeloma Institute for Research and Therapy at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He earned his doctoral degree at or MD at Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands and his PhD at the University of London. He was a fellow in hematology and research fellow at the Hammersmith Hospital and Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London. He was also a registrar fellow in hematology at John Grant Radcliffe University Hospital, Oxford, and at the University Hospital in Nottingham. Nottingham, sorry. Dr. Von Rees' research focuses on immunotherapy. He leads a developmental therapeutics project in the Myeloma Institute's PO1 grant called Growth Control in Multiple Myeloma from the NCI. He's a member of the International Society for Experimental Hematology, International Society for, Ce- for Cellular Therapy, and the European Group for Bone and Marrow Transplantation. He's on the editorial board for Annals of Hematology, Bone Marrow Transplantation Cytotherapy, and reviews for many journals including Blood, Clinical Cancer Research, and the British Journal of Hematology, including many others. Dr. Stephen Russell is a board-certified hematologist and world leader in the field of gene and viral therapy. He graduated from Edinburgh University Medical School in England. Having decided as a medical undergraduate, he would spend his life attempting to convert viruses into powerful anti-cancer drugs. Dr. Russell moved from Cambridge to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 1998 to build and direct a new molecular medicine program focused on the development and clinical testing of new genetically-based therapeutics. He is Professor of Medicine with the distinction of of a named professorship, the Richard O. Jacobson Professorship in Molecular Medicine. He serves as an Associate Medical Director for the Department of Development at Mayo Clinic, Associate Director, Director for Translational Research in the Cancer Center, and Deputy Director for Translation 
Center for Regenerative Medicine in the Mayo Clinic as well. He was one of the founding board members of the European Society of Gene Therapy and a member of the board of the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy. He serves on the editorial board with many scientific journals, including Human Gene Therapy, Gene Therapy, Cancer Gene Therapy, and the Journal of Gene Medicine, and the Journal of Molecular Medicine. He's also the co-author of more than 275 peer-reviewed scientific publications. Now, so thank you so much again for joining us. And I, um, we have done shows with both of you on two different topics, but um, as most who are listening know, there was a big, huge media splash that talked about the measles vaccine in myeloma. And um, Dr. Russell, we can link to the show that has a great detail about this, but I think it's important for you to start by giving us some background on um, your research background and how you determined to do this, what you found in your first studies, and then we'll move on from there. Well, the, the, thanks very much, Jenny. So the whole idea of um, virus therapy for um, cancer is completely different from other cancer therapies. It, um, the idea is that because cancer, uh, because uh, viruses are known to destroy uh, tissues in the body, you know, different viruses destroy different tissues like hepatitis viruses damage the liver, um, the AIDS virus damages the immune system, um, and so on, and pneumonia viruses damage the lung. Um, the idea emerged quite some time ago that, well, how about if you try and make viruses that specifically damage cancer and that leave everything else unharmed in the body? And... Um, and people have attempted this since back in the 1950s, um, but typically the outcomes were a bit discouraging because the viruses were not honed in any way to target the cancer. And so if the cancer responded, then the patient typically subsequently died. Um, what's become possible in recent years is that we can really work with viruses and change them in such a way that they do become more specific. Um, and we really can now think in terms of viruses that specifically um, target and destroy cancer cells while leaving normal tissues unharmed. And that's really what this is about. We, there are many, many viruses to choose from, probably 3,500 different viruses are known. Um, but what we've gone for is um, a, a, an attenuated, i.e. weakened, uh, strain of the measles virus. And the history of this virus is really quite interesting because um, it originated in the throat of a, um, a boy named David Edmondson back in 1954 um, when he had a measles infection. Uh, the virus was isolated from his body because it was about that time that viruses were just be beginning to be grown in the lab. And it was that strain of virus that was used to develop the measles vaccines that have been used to control uh, measles infections globally. Um, mm. But it just so happens that that strain, the Edmonston strain of measles virus, when it's um, adapted to grow on cancer cells in the lab, becomes a pretty good oncolytic virus. And the uh, strain of measles that we've chosen originated from David Edmondson's throat. It's been taught to grow on cancer cells, and then it's been genetically modified um, to uh, encode a gene that allows us to see where it's got to in the body. We can do an imaging study, and we can see where the infection has got to in the body. Because if you think about it, giving a virus as a therapy for a cancer you expect that virus to grow and change over time. And if you want to be able to see what's going on inside the body, then you do need this type of imaging kind of snitch uh, modification. So that's the virus that we have. We did a lot of work with it in preclinical testing before we entered clinical studies. Uh, we went through the classic sort of phase one study pathway where we start with a very low uh, some would say homeopathic dose of virus, and we gradually increase the dose between cohorts of three patients until finally, finally, two years ago, we reached the top dose level, um, which was a huge amount of virus given into a vein, 
um, the purpose being to for the virus to seek out, attack, infect, and destroy the myeloma cells. We got to the very top dose, and the second patient that we treated at that dose level had a, a remarkable response, and that was uh, Stacy Erholtz, who um, was at the time 49 years old. She'd had myeloma for several years. She'd had two stem cell transplants. She'd become refractory to uh, Cyborg D therapy and to Revlimid plus dexamethasone therapy. And uh, her disease was relapsing about eight months out from her most recent stem cell transplant. And she had a an egg-sized tumor growing out of her left forehead, which her family had named Evan. Uh, she had mm. four other um, plasma cytomas that we could see on the PET CT scan, and she had diffuse infiltration of her bone marrow, although the percentage of myeloma cells there was relatively low. So anyway, she elected to um, uh, to enroll in this clinical protocol and she really had the most dramatic um, response. A single intravenous infusion of the virus um, led to complete resolution of her myeloma at all sites in the bone marrow and these um, plasma cytomas. And about nine months after she'd received that um, treatment, the tumor on her forehead did start to return and was therefore irradiated. She had local radiotherapy. And subsequent to that, she's remained in complete remission. It was interesting, actually, because we, you know, she and we alike were very worried that the myeloma would come back elsewhere, but it hasn't done that. Mm. Um, and it really was a very local relapse at the, um, at the site of the plasma cytoma on her forehead. So she's remarkable. You know, she's the first patient, patient ever anywhere with any cancer type to have such a response to intravenously administered oncolytic virus. So she sort of proved to us what is possible, what can be achieved with this totally new um, treatment modality. And now the... Um, the challenge that faces us is how to um, transform that into something reliable, reproducible that everybody can benefit from. Okay, that's perfect. Um, it's such an exciting idea to be able to use a vaccine to cure cancer. It's just so exciting. Um, we're so thrilled. So can you give us some information about what else you saw and then um, the barriers that you saw and what you're trying to overcome now? Well, yeah, of course. We, we, you know, what we want to understand is, well, why and how did this, um, you know, remarkable outcome occur and, and how do we make it happen in other people? There are some things about Stacy that we think are probably very important. One of those things is that she did not have detectable antibodies against the measles virus in her blood. Most of us who've had measles or been vaccinated against measles will have antibodies in the blood that can intercept and destroy the virus before it reaches the target site. So infusing a virus into the bloodstream is not going to be very effective if the virus is destroyed before it reaches the target. Now, we have various ways of addressing this problem, but when we're giving naked virus, not cloaked with anything into the bloodstream, then really not having any antibody there we thought was going to be important. And actually, it turned out that Stacy did have um, very, very, very low levels of anti-measles antibody. So we think that's important. So we don't know how important... She is that she had only very low disease burden. You know, she was relapsing and she was relatively early in her relapse at the time we treated her. And we think that may be important. But we, we do see antibody as a barrier. It may be that very advanced disease is also a barrier. So, you know, we're just, we're exploring at the moment. We really do not know. Um, the immune system, though, is is something to really focus on because under normal circumstances, our immune system functions to protect us from virus infections. 
And in this scenario, the immune system functions to protect the cancer from the damaging effect of the virus. And for that reason, this study that we're proposing now with Dr. Van Rie is designed to address that problem because we know that it's sort of a race between the virus and the immune system when we initiate this treatment. The virus can infect the cancer, it can spread in the cancer, it can damage the cancer cells, but that process stops as soon as the immune system shuts the virus down. What cyclophosphamide does is it substantially slows and delays the immune response to the virus. So by giving cyclophosphamide along with the virus, which is what Dr. Van Rie's study is going to um, explore, we'll be slowing the immune system and giving the virus a much better opportunity to spread for a longer period of time in the cancer, thereby um, leading to more tumor destruction. Okay, well, that makes sense about why you're adding the cyclophosphamide. I I didn't understand that before, just in reading the proposal, so that's why this is so helpful to have you describe what you're trying to accomplish. I have a follow-up question about um, Stacy. So she had never had measles, for one, obviously, and she had never been vaccinated for measles. Well, Was interestingly, Stacy had been vaccinated, um, mm-hmm. both as a child and um, two years following her first stem cell transplant, which was um, routine um, post-transplant vaccination protocol uh, here at Mayo Clinic. And, um, but subsequently, she lost her anti-measles antibody. And this is a, a very important feature of multiple myeloma, is that because it suppresses the production of antibodies, myeloma patients often lose their antiviral immunity. And that did happen with Stacy. Um, so, and it's happened with many other myeloma patients. I mean, we have been evaluating um, many, many patients to determine what the antibody status is, how many of those patients have anti-measles antibody. And what we found is that about half of the myeloma patients we've tested do not have protective levels of anti-measles antibody and about a third of the myeloma patients we tested have virtually undetectable um, anti-measles antibody. And so for the clinical trials that we're doing with naked antibody, you know, where we haven't attempted to mask the, um, uh, with naked virus, where we haven't attempted to mask the virus from the antibody neutralization, we're focusing specifically on those patients who have virtually no detectable anti-measles antibody. So it's a third of the patients that we screen we expect to be eligible on that basis. And that has nothing to do with, have you seen that just across all types of myeloma, or have you seen certain types of myeloma that have um, more of the antibody present than not? Well, that would be really interesting to look at. Um, we we have not looked into that. We've not tried to sort of uh, dig deeper into the um, I- into the data that we have. But I think that's a good suggestion because there may be specific types of myeloma that are more likely to be associated with loss of immunity. Yeah, that, I'm just. And how do you screen for this? Oh, it's a simple test, a simple lab test um, that um, just uh, looks for, well, there, there are actually two tests we do. One of them is a simple, straightforward lab test that's present in, uh, that's available pretty much in any hospital lab. Um, it's a variation on something called an ELISA, and it's um, it's just there's a, um, some beads, they have um, measles um, proteins on their surface, and they're mixed with the blood, and then they're tested to see whether they've captured antibody. And, and if they have, then you know that there was anti-measles antibody in the blood. Um, the other test that we do is we add um, the patient's blood to live measles virus 
in the lab here at Mayo and we determine whether the, the blood is able to neutralize the virus. Hmm. And I know in your um, when we first spoke about the measles virus, the Mayo Clinic was working on manufacturing, doing all the manufacturing in-house. And um, have you found, um, I guess, how have you developed that process? I've, because it's been quite a few months since we spoke. So we have actually been working um, with a contract manufacturing organization, and we've transferred the process um, to to a group of, um, of scientists in that company. Uh, I'm not at liberty to state which company it is, but um, they have the ability to scale up the manufacturer and take it to a much um, larger culture system than we have available at Mayo. We we can reach a maximum of 75 liters, um, but you know clearly if we take it up to a thousand liters per production run, we're going to have much higher yields. The other thing we're doing is is working on the um, the cells that the cell culture system that we use to grow the virus to see if we can get higher yields. Um, in the first place before we start the purification process. Okay. And um, have you made any changes in dosing, or did you just determine that dose with Stacy, and that's the dose that you're going to be using in the future? Well, yeah, I, Fritz can maybe comment on that, because um, Fritz is, is, um, is going to go down to a lower dose. I'm going to hand over to you, Fritz. Yeah, I think um, what we're going to try and see whether uh, the cyclophosphamide suppresses the immune response to, to the virus and delays the emergence of the antibody. Um, so it sets the stage for prolonged replication of the virus, uh, and perhaps it allows us to give a lower dose of the virus than, than is currently given. Um, so the clinical trial, which is now, which is actually now open in Little Rock, so we are, are ready to enroll patients. Uh, it, it just opened. Um, we, we do a slow, we do a, a dose escalation, um, and um, uh, up until levels that were, that are currently being used uh, uh, at the Mayo Clinic by by Dr. Russell. So the hope is that we get make the virus. Um, let the virus replicate longer uh, in the body and, and have better uh, better efficacy um, and delay the immune response. Okay, and and uh, some questions about who can join the clinical trial if it's open right now. Are you looking at patients with just low disease burden? Um, and then I know, Cynthia, you had some questions about for whom the project um, was for with uh, some CD46 questions. So, yeah, I, I do. Do you want to go ahead and ask that? Yeah, I, I was reading, I guess, in the proposal that um, the, pa the prospective patients, there was something with the CD46 that was expressed on their cells. Now, would, is that something that's expressed on most high-risk patient cells? Would that be something that you would have to have to be part of the um, this clinical trial? Um, no, it, it is not an, an uh, eligibility criterion. And the reason for that is that CD46 is expressed on all myeloma cells. So it's not necessary to screen or test for that. So the CD46 molecule uh, is present in myeloma cells at the cell surface. And it's the... Uh, and it's the uh, it's the protein to which the measles virus ducks and gets into the cell. But it's uh, expressed on all myeloma cells and in all types of myeloma. Okay, so it's always found on myeloma. Is it found on any of the normal tissues? I mean, would the virus be attacking some things that they should not be attacking? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, the... The molecule is expressed, C46 is expressed uh, on normal tissues, but at a very low level. 
Um, and Dr. Russell has done extensive safety uh, studies, uh, both in mice made permissible um, uh, to measles virus infection uh, in monkeys. And obviously, we now have the human data, and the, the safety signal is very good, which means that the low expression on CD, uh, of CD46 on normal tissues is not a problem. Uh, and does not cause illness uh, uh, in the patient. In other words, normal cells do not get infected. So we are not that concerned about uh, side effects or toxicity with uh, the virus. The, the main purpose is to try uh, and get the, the get the therapy more uh, more effective. Okay, yes, we quick. we um, we did some uh, what I think were very interesting studies in the lab where we took. Um, cells that did not have CD46 on their surface and we modified them so that they did express it on their surface in different amounts and so we had a whole panel of cell lines expressing different uh, amounts of CD46 on the surface and when we put the virus on them um, no CD46 meant no infection as the amount of CD46 increased, the amount of infection increased. And then above a certain threshold level, the infected cells started to fuse with each other and die, and they looked absolutely dreadful. And so the virus is really able to discriminate high from low density. And although it may give a low level of infection on cells, i.e. normal cells in the body that have low amounts of CD46, it doesn't really harm them. Um, but once you get up to a very high CD46 level, it, um, it causes uh, very substantial damage. And, um, and we tested every myeloma patient that we've treated with the measles virus to see whether their normal bone marrow cells and their myeloma cells from the bone marrow biopsy have different amounts of CD46, and they do. And on average, it's 10 times higher um, expression of CD46 on the myeloma cells versus the non-myeloma cells in the bone marrow. Uh, okay, so it's something that we really shouldn't be too concerned about. If for any reason something does go wrong, I guess you could just inject a uh, anti-measles antibody to stop the reaction? Is there a way to stop this reaction once it goes through? Well, we we have that written into the protocol that um, if anything untoward were to happen and if the, the virus were to spread uncontrollably in normal tissues that we would use anti-measles um, anti-serum. In fact, we'd probably use IVIG because that contains a lot of um, anti-measles antibody. But just, you know, on that safety question, because FDA were very interested in it, um, there have been well over a billion people vaccinated and so those people have been given live um, attenuated weakened measles virus that belongs to this Edmonston lineage. And so far there have been only two cases where the virus was able to continue to grow in the patient and cause disease. So it's virtually unheard of, the scenario that you're suggesting. And we did not see any evidence of it in any of the patients who've been treated to date. So I think it's probably more of a theoretical than a real concern. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I also have a question. Why did you choose cyclophosphamide as the agent to, to lower the amount of anti-measles antibodies that you have in your system? Uh, cyclophosphamide is in a, a chemotherapy drug which has been around uh, for a very long uh, time. Um, so its uh, its safety record uh, and, uh, uh, is excellent and we know how to use it. Uh, it's also used as an immunosuppressive agent uh, 
for instance, uh, for the treatment of autoimmune disorders, for graft versus host disease after uh, allogeneic transplant, just to name a few examples. Um, um, so we know that the, that the drug dampens uh, uh, the immune response, um, and uh, it's a very well tried and tested uh, 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 drug, so that's why it was selected. Okay, good. And so now that there's a way of lowering the amounts of anti measles antibodies in the blood, would that threshold of one third of the people that have the undetectable anti measles um, antibody, would that be able to be increased to more patients to be able to enroll in a trial like this? Well, that's an, that's an. A, 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 the trial mainly aims to to prevent uh, occurrence or to delay the occurrence of the, of the uh, of the anti measles virus antibody. It is not aimed to uh, uh, to diminish pre existing antibody. Okay, so in I fact, understand. patients with substantial amounts of pre existing anti measles antibodies are not eligible for the trial. So you need to have a very low level of antibody to be able. To be eligible, and then this, uh, the purpose of the, the cyclophosphamide is to delay uh, the occurrence of the anti measles virus antibody. Oh, got it. Thank you so much. I guess so, that's the end of my questions for now. Well, uh, just I'll I'll, um, I'll add a little more to the answer that uh, Fritz just gave you, which is that in those patients that do have anti measles antibody you know the reason that um dr van Rie and i initially started discussing um a collaboration on this work was that dr van Rie has been using natural killer cells as a therapy for myeloma um he um, isolates the cells from the blood, grows them up, and then um, gives them back to um, seek and destroy myeloma cells. And um, we had, at the same time that he was working on that approach, we had been studying in our laboratory an approach to um, prevent the neutralization of measles. And what we had done was to infect um, cells with measles virus and then put them into the bloodstream instead of putting the virus um, itself into the bloodstream. And we found that if we did that, we could actually bypass all that neutralizing antibody. The cells would carry the virus to the target site, to the myeloma, and uh, would release progeny viruses that would then infect and destroy the myeloma. And so, we thought, well, maybe we could put our approaches together and we could use Dr. Van Rie's um, natural killer cells and uh, combine them with the virus and use his cells as the carriers in patients who had antibody. And that is something that we still are very enthusiastic to get to. But in this first instance, um, we're sort of looking at the low fruit, if you like, um, which is holding the immune system at bay with the cyclophosphamide and seeing how much difference that makes. Um, but we're, we we certainly have a plan to, um, in the not-too-distant future, move ahead with a cell carrier um, approach to deliver the virus in patients who have neutralizing antibodies. Well, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay, just some follow-up questions. Um, Dr. Von Reed, do you want to walk everyone through the um, just how the clinical trial works and the timing of everything? For example, um, you know, how are the cells removed? How are they given back? When are they given back? When do you get the cyclophosphamide? And just kind of step us through that process. Okay, maybe we should uh, start to touch on, on who is eligible for the trial. Perfect. Um, uh, Patients should have failed uh, standard standard therapies uh, and have more uh, advanced disease. So they need to have relapsed disease. They need to have had at least one stem cell transplant and not be responding to an immunomodulatory drug or to a proteasome inhibitor. Um, uh, so we're looking at patients with more 
with more uh, advanced disease. There is no uh, mm -hmm. specified criterion that they necessarily need to have a low disease burden. Um, then, uh, in terms of treatment, uh, the patients get one dose of cyclophosphamide, and the next day they get the cyclophosphamide and they get the virus infused, um, and they get for two further days uh, uh, cyclophosphamide uh, infused. Uh, yeah. So, uh, overall, they get four doses uh, of cyclophosphamide, and on the second day they get the virus. Uh, the four doses are uh, are chosen uh, because uh, we commonly use this in a regimen at our center called VDT Pace, and th there are, are actually exactly the same doses as we use in the VDT Pace. Um, so we're well familiar with the with the toxicity of the cyclophosphamide. Uh, in addition, this dose uh, translates back. Uh, to the dose used uh, in um, mouse studies by Dr. Russell, uh, uh, where he found that this dose uh, would uh, suppress the emergence of uh, uh, anti-measles virus uh, uh, antibody. After the treatment is being given, then obviously the patients are carefully uh, uh, followed uh, for uh, uh, for their well-being, for their response. Um, both in terms of clinical response um, and emergence uh, of the anti measles virus uh, antibody. Uh, in addition, as Dr. Russell already hinted at, the, uh, Dr. Russell modified um, this vaccine strain to allow for imaging. Uh, so we will be doing imaging studies uh, to see where the virus goes uh, and importantly, how long it's going to persist, um, and whether it persists at sites uh, where the myeloma uh, is. So one of the things that we've written in, in our uh, crowd ground proposal is to do additional imaging studies, because it's obvious of crucial importance that the virus doesn't only has the chance to replicate and persist longer, but that it persists at the right sites. Okay, I'm taking notes. <laughs> and um, that kind of makes me think about the question, how long can this vaccine stay in the body and be effective? Well, it, it is a virus, and even uh, even uh, patients who are uh, heavily pretreated uh, and have a dysfunctional immune system, both due to, due to the myeloma and their uh, um and their treatment will eventually mount an immune response. Uh, a foreign virus is a very potent uh, stimulant, even of a somewhat crippled immune system. So we do anticipate uh, that uh, neutralizing antibody will uh, appear, albeit in a delayed fashion. Yes, if, if I just kind of uh, add a little more to that. the. Um the way the virus works, um, and, and it's true of other oncolytic viruses, is that in the first step of the therapy, the virus infects the cancer cells and kills them. Um, and that process continues for as long as it takes the immune system to stop the virus. At the end of that killing spree, where the virus has been killing tumor cells, um, and which ends when the immune system has got control of the virus, there are typically going to be still tumor cells that have survived. And so the virus is now gone, and there are still some um, myeloma cells that need to be mopped up. And it's at that point that the immune system, having destroyed the virus-infected cancer cells, is now much better able to recognize the uninfected myeloma cells. And so there's an immunotherapeutic um, uh, phase to the treatment. And this we know from the, um, from the mouse studies that we've done. We know that it works in these two uh, component stages. 
And we think that that is what is going on with Stacy, because you know Stacy has very long-term control. Uh, even after that brief relapse of her cancer. And we think that the immune system has been responsible for controlling the disease over the longer term, whereas the uh, immediate early destruction of the tumor was due to the virus um, replicating, spreading in the cancer and destroying it. So the, the virus may not persist long term in the body, but the immune system learns during the virus infection to attack myeloma cells. So it's kind of like resetting your immune system back to what a healthy individual might look like? Is that a good way of saying it or no? That is, uh, but it's more than that. It, it's not only resetting the immune system in that way, but it's also teaching the immune system to recognize the cancer. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's a huge um, and very important aspect of modern um, uh cancer therapy with the development of the checkpoint inhibitor antibody approach. And so, you know, we, we do envisage that down the road, um, it's going to be a very potent combination of um, mixing oncolytic viruses with checkpoint inhibitor antibodies. And kind of continuing that idea of combination therapies <clears throat> in myeloma. Now, in um in one of our previous interviews one of the doctor was saying that on average the a general myeloma patient might have excuse me <clears throat> five separate types of myeloma clones in myeloma cells that you're saying they all express the CD46 so hypothetically they would all be wiped out and then if there are others as that vaccine teaches kills off the first that and then teaches the immune system it can go after those others. Is that correct? So yeah, trying to get everything. That is correct. And, and you know, I think this is a, you know, it's different from a small molecule in that you know here you have a fairly complex biological therapy that works in more than one way, and that recruits different, um, um, different parts of the immune system to help it do its job. So it may be that this will be a better way to overcome that heterogeneity that you're talking about where there are multiple different clones of myeloma cells um, which all need to be controlled by the same therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope it could be controlled by the same therapy because it'd be great if something didn't grow up later. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's the goal. You know, yeah. I think we still have a long way to go, but um but you know, that the 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 dream is absolutely um you know, on fire at the moment and I think um the fact that um Stacy Erholtz is doing so well 2 years out from that initial therapy is really uh, quite an inspiration to us to continue with this work. Um, so, and she actually um, asked me to uh, mention that she's half Dutch, and she wanted um, Dr. Van Rie to know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's all good. I'm so thrilled for her, and I'm so thrilled for you that this is um, something that you've studied for so long and you're seeing the fruits of some very hard work, I'm sure. So, Jack, did you have some questions? I know you did. I have a couple of follow-ups. I think a lot of the original questions I had have been asked and answered, which I'm really appreciative of. Um, the uh, Just following up on the eligibility or ineligibility criteria, are there any related to either age or secretion or high risk? Hello. Oh, could you Brit? can can you hear us? Uh, we lost Dr. Henry. Oh. Oh. Okay. Should I ask the question again, or do you want to try to answer, Dr. Russell? Yeah, I can answer. Um, so, the 
Well, you know, the the and Dutch Van Rie was going to answer this question. So if he if he does call back in, then we'll um, we'll certainly have him um, respond. Um, but the these the the patients to be enrolled in the study will, by definition, be high risk because they will have become um, uh, resistant to other myeloma therapies, and that in itself puts um, puts you into a high risk category. Um, so high risk in this context isn't really going to be defined according to the cytogenetics or what you know whether it's plasmablastic disease or whatever. It's going to be defined according to the stage of the disease um, in relation to the um, the therapies that have been administered. I so, Dr. Bonry, I think you're back. Yeah, uh, I got cut off. Um, so the question um, that Jack answered and Dr. Russell was answering was: Is the eligibility criteria what con what you consider to be high risk? Yeah, effectively, the, the most of these patients will be high risk because they will uh, fail the standard therapies. In addition, uh, patients who uh, have extramedullary disease, disease, disease growing outside the bone marrow, will be eligible. Patients with abnormal uh, cytogenetics are eligible. Uh, so we are looking at a high-risk uh, population. Um, and I know this would be Pat's question, too. How about secretion? If you're a non-secretory myeloma patient, would you qualify? Yes, you would. Okay. You don't need to make an, uh, a myeloma protein. In fact, many of the patients with more advanced disease don't make much myeloma protein, or uh, sometimes they're entirely non-secretory, and we have to follow them by uh, imaging, and we use MRI or, or PET scanning to, uh, to do that. Um, going back to the prior discussion briefly, one point that I would like to make about the immune response is that uh, in, in my lab, we've actually looked for myeloma-specific T cells, uh, which are myeloma-specific immune cells, and the majority of myeloma patients do have these. So the measles virus uh, sets the stage for, uh, an, uh, for cell death and creating an immunogenic environment, and the myeloma proteins, the tumor proteins, will be presented to the immune system and then there's already a pool or reservoir of myeloma-specific immune cells, which then hopefully can expand and add uh, 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 and add to the therapeutic effect. Um, and that has, in humans, not been looked at. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to do uh, with the viral therapy in the, in our uh, research uh, proposal. So we're going to look uh, at the. Uh, uh, reactivation of the immune response and see if the better these myeloma specific immune cells expand and kill myeloma. And just a quick follow up question before Jack. I know Jack has more questions. When you say myeloma specific T cells exist, is that in blood or in the bone marrow cells? Well, we've looked in the blood, but uh, these cells also traffic to the bone marrow, so they undoubtedly will be in the bone marrow as well. And in fact, we propose to look in the bone marrow uh, in this study. Hmm. Okay, Jack, what else did you have? Still along the uh, criteria, I know you said patients had to have had an autotransplant as well as be non-responsive to image and proteasome inhibitor. Is there... Any other ineligibility criteria that might surprise a patient? Maybe they're too old or, or anything else that is out of the ordinary, I guess? Well, we, we would exclude patients who are medically not uh, fit. So yeah. like in all, uh, with all clinical trials, yeah. uh, you can't enroll patients with multiple other uh, 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 diseases, uh, excluding them from treatment. Yeah, I understand that, comorbidities and such. But otherwise, it seems like it's a relatively inclusive trial. Correct. Um, and how many... Any, con Go ahead, with, Jack. Sorry. Uh, any concerns with cyclophosphamide, which I'll call cytoxin because it has two fewer syllables and other listeners might want to know they're the same? 
Um, any concerns with cytoxin infusions inhibiting the effectiveness of viral therapy? Is there? I, I don't know if there could be any unsynergistic uh, uh, outcomes here. No, we For example, affect, no, we would not anticipate that the cytoplasmide would affect the efficacy uh, of the measles virus uh, at all. Um, so we don't anticipate any negative effects in that in that regard. And regarding Stacy's wonderful outcome, I think you mentioned she was one of three that were treated at the same dosage level and such. Is there something that distinguished her from the other two, which I assume did not have a favorable response? She was actually, in the phase one trial, there were six patients treated at that top dose mm -hmm. level. Um, and she was the star of the show. Um, one other patient had um, very extensive, very, very extensive disease and had um, a transient response. Um, she had many plasma cytomas in the muscles of her legs and her abdominal wall uh, that had become refractory to everything. They, the plasma cytomas um, started to hurt uh, about a week after the virus had been infused, and um, the free light chain level dropped to less than half its starting level. And on day eight, the imaging study that we did showed that the virus was um, basically cooking in all of those plasma cytomas, and we were very excited. Um, but within about four weeks of receiving the virus, all of the um, uh, imaging signal had faded, uh, the tumors were no longer um, painful, and the free light chain level was rising again. Now, the other four patients did not respond. When we looked at the antibody, um, anti-measles antibody levels in those six patients, Two of the six were measles antibody negative, and those were the Stacy number one, and this patient that I just described to you, number two. So that made us think that a critical factor was uh, anti-measles antibody. And the eight patients that you mentioned in the phase two where you gave a single cytoxin injection, did they have higher levels of the measles antibodies, or why didn't, I think... No, in the phase two study, we're moving to patients who do not have anti-measles antibody. We, we didn't give them a single cytoxan injection because we have not um, been using the combination of cytoxan with measles in the phase two. It's single-agent measles. Um, administered intravenously. But um, the patients that we were treating for um, initially in that study had very um, advanced treatment refractory disease. Um, the difference between those patients and Stacy is that um, if Stacy had been at the time of her relapse given um, Velcade, Revlimid, Carfilzomib, Pomalidomide, Cyclophosphamide, additional Melphalan, Bendamustine, and had continued to grow through all of those and had reached the point of having very bulky disease, then that is the situation that most of the patients we've treated in the phase two have been in. And we think that that is too advanced. And so we've modified the entry criteria for the phase two study that's going on at, at Mayo Clinic so that we will be treating patients with earlier stage disease and with less disease burden. The, the letter of intent, though, I think I read, said that a cohort of eight patients received the uh, virus infusion along with a single dose of cytoxin. Is that correct? 
that was very early on in the phase one trial at a much lower dose level. Ah, okay. And okay. the dose of cyclophosphamide administered was very low. Yeah. Okay. And um, it, it was we, we abandoned it because we um, uh, we at that point we had a breakthrough with the manufacturing and we were therefore able to push the dose up to a much higher level and so we decided that rather than pursue cyclophosphamide combination therapy at that point um, we would uh, pursue dose escalation. Um, Meanwhile, we completed additional studies on the combination of cyclophosphamide with um, virus therapy and discovered in the, in the course of doing those studies that the dose of cyclophosphamide needed to be substantially higher in order to have the desired impact. And that is the cyclophosphamide regimen that Dr. Van Rees is using in the study um, uh, that has just opened at... Um, um, Arkansas. I understand. Thanks very much. I wish you the very best of success with this subsequent trial. Thank you. We're very Thank excited. You. Well, I think it's so exciting, and I think it's fabulous that you have imaging studies that you can really watch what's happening and see where it's effective and when it loses it in effectivity. It's amazing. Yeah, the the imaging is, is critically important for this because... Um, you know, cyclophosphamide does have known activity against multiple myeloma, and the ability to be able to independently track the um, uh, the propagation of the virus in the body using the imaging study is therefore crucial, so that when we see responses, we'll know what the relative contributions of the cyclophosphamide and the virus therapy are. Well, it's totally fascinating. So one other question, two other questions that I have, and then I want to still allow some time for caller questions, is um, first, how many patients are you working to enroll in this Phase two trial? Well, we're going to uh, enroll altogether all, all uh, around uh, 16 patients. And that's just at UAMS, right? You're not... This is a study primarily there, but you're working together on the construction of the study? Yes, so the UAMS trial is the combination of measles virus with cyclophosphamide. Um, in the ongoing phase two study of virus alone at Mayo Clinic, it's up to 42 patients. Okay. And those are just going to run simultaneously, right? Pardon? They'll be running no. simultaneously, mm -hmm. yes. I think obviously if, if our study proves to be successful, we hope that we can expand it and treat more patients. But the initial oh. uh, plan is for 16 here at UMS. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe my last question would be, can you kind of outline the different milestones that you have with a timeline and then expected budget requirements to do what you would like to do? Yeah, I think what we would like to, one of the major milestones, obviously, is to um, see that the cyclophosphamide will uh, 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 hamper the occurrence of the um, anti measles virus uh, uh, response. So we'd like to see that the, uh, that the, the measles virus antibody is generated later, and we'd like to see uh, that there's prolongation uh, of the viral replication uh, in the blood, and hopefully we're also going to see with the repeated studies, um, that uh, imaging studies, that it is actually replicating uh, uh, at uh, uh, tumor sites. In the first four patients, we're going to go through an, a dose escalation, so we're going to start at a lower, uh, at a lower dose before we reach those uh, those levels currently used at the Mayo Clinic. So. Uh, the next 12 patients will be treated at much higher levels um, and hopefully we are going to see a, as a major milestone uh, uh, responses um, 
And as Dr. Russell already pointed out, the, the, this occurrence of an immune response may, may prove very important in, in maintaining uh, responses and maintaining uh, uh, remission. So another milestone uh, would be that we can actually um, uh, detect uh, 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 the uh, tumor-specific uh, immune cells and that we can see that they multiply in the patients. Um, and obviously we can demonstrate in the lab that they have the ability to kill uh, myeloma cells. So, so those are the uh, major mile, milestones. And the, and the other non-scientific milestone, um, which is the real goal, is we want to see another Stacy, and then we want to see another Stacy, <laughs> and then again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the goal of this, obviously, is to, um, you know, see, see um, those dramatic responses. Um, but clearly the, the scientific milestones are really um, critical in enabling us to reach that um, ultimate goal. Oh well, we love that goal. We love we love the research, and we love that goal. Is there um, an estimated cost per patient, like for manufacturing costs, or just um, overall to do the project? Well, obviously, these therapies uh, are 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 not. Uh, 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 are not necessarily cheap in terms of manufacture and um, if you cost out the the whole clinical trial um it adds up to a significant amount of money uh, per patient um what we obviously are, are seeking support for is the additional studies um both in terms of imaging and uh, in, uh, uh and in terms of understanding uh, what happens with this therapy, um, uh, both with the anti-nasal virus neutralizing antibody and and the immune uh, the immune response? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the cost of manufacturing, I don't think is is something that we um, are seeking through the um, the um, crowd initiative. Um, manufacturing clearly is a uh, potentially um, very substantial part of the cost of performing these studies. But, you know, if the if it does prove to be the case in the study that Dr. Van Rie is doing that a lower dose of virus is much more effective when combined with cyclophosphamide, then that could be a huge uh, advantage in respect to the long-term costs of manufacturing a dose for a patient. Um, but at the moment, we have other sources of funds that are taking care of the manufacturing costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I don't want to take all the time. I want to open it up for caller questions. So if you have a question for the doctors, please press 1 on your keypad. And um, I know we're, we're a little past our time, but we're going to keep you just for a few more minutes, if you don't mind. So our first caller, 2046956, go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you for taking my call. So my question is, I um, had a stem cell transplant, and let's say, you know, and I have gotten the, <coughs> excuse me, the measles vaccine since the transplant. If that makes me ineligible for this kind of treatment, would you suggest perhaps that a patient have another transplant and kind of wipe the slate clean? Would that make someone eligible for this treatment that isn't potentially at the moment? I, I think obviously you need to have effective therapy for your uh, for your myeloma. Um, and uh, I don't think that your strategy should be directed at purely uh, eliminating the, the, the measles virus uh, antibody. Uh, the other point to make is, I don't know what treatment you've had following your transplant, but if you have had maintenance therapy with some uh, some drugs, it might be that you haven't had a good response to the vaccine and that you uh, have not had uh, 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 antibodies generated. So even if you the fact that you've been vaccinated, in my view, it might still be worthwhile 
to test to see whether you've got anti-mesovirus antibodies if you have had uh, maintenance treatment. Okay, I have, so that's definitely worth looking into. Um, I also but I would, wanted to know... It's a very important point you're making, and I, I would make a very strong plea to any patients who are listening not to aim for strategies that will get rid of anti-measles antibodies. This is not a proven effective therapy. This is experimental therapy, and it's just wrong to change your treatment plan in order to make yourself eligible for this treatment. You know, if and when it's proven and we've ironed out all the problems and we do have a reliable, reproducible, effective therapy, then maybe would be the time to consider that sort of thing. But it would just be completely wrong for us to say to you, go ahead and have a second transplant to see if you can get rid of your anti-measles antibody. That's absolutely not appropriate. Okay. Okay, and what is the... Um what is the um, commitment to participate in the trial? How much travel, how much time, for example? Well, you will spend, uh, essentially, you will be the first month uh, in Arkansas, and then you will be coming uh, every three months here uh, uh, for, uh, for at least a year. So uh, it does require some, some time and travel and dedication. Okay. So I also have my mother here with me. She's my she was my caregiver, and she has a question if that's okay. I understand you are in phase two of your work, and I was wondering, for us that are eager, of course, on the situation, how long do you anticipate before we hear? Is there is your uh, plan if your system is giving positive results? Will they say year two or three? Well, the, the way, so we're enrolling at UAMS, uh, the plan is to do 16 patients, uh, and we're hoping to enroll about one per month. Uh, so realistically, we're looking at one half years before enrollment is completed. Um, uh, but we should be able to get uh, an idea about the efficacy of the therapy in, in the next two years or at least the efficacy of the approach of combining cyclophosphamide with the virus. I would, I would agree with that assessment. I think we need two years. Um, I would um, be delighted if we were able to, you know, shout something from the rooftop sooner than that. Um, but I think it's reasonable to uh, think in terms of two years before we have a a much better fix on um, on how effective the virus is and under what circumstances. I know this is somewhat of a difficult question for you doctors to answer, but compared to all the other treatments that are being developed right now, and I'm sure you're familiar with all of them, would you say yours is extremely promising at this point as opposed to others? Maybe I want to say something first. One of one of the exciting things about this therapy is that it's not it's not dependent on the risk profile of the myeloma or the genetics of the myeloma. So this biotherapy approach uh, could overcome potentially uh, uh, nasty mutations in the myeloma uh, clone, and that makes this type of approach so exciting. And Steve, maybe you want to elaborate on yeah, that. Yeah, what, what, um, relative to other myeloma therapies, I, um, you know, obviously I'm going to have a, a very um, optimistic perspective. You know, I totally believe in this approach to therapy. And having seen the um, dramatic response that Stacey Erholtz had, um, I now know that it can be effective, and you know we really just need to um, determine how. The other treatments that we have available work. 
um, you know, the new imids, um, the new proteasome inhibitors, the monoclonal antibodies against CD38, they definitely have antimyeloma activity. Um, putting all those drugs together is going to give us better and better outcomes. Um, the problem I see with um, our approach to myeloma therapy is that we keep people on treatment for a long period of time. And there's a very high uh, penalty paid in terms of toxicity um, for the treatment that we do give. And actually, one of the things that Stacy said to me was that of all her my myeloma therapies to date, um, this was the one that gave her the best remission because she was off all therapy. You know, it was a single intravenous administration of a, a, a virus and then no therapy other than the local radiotherapy for the next two years. So it was, uh, you know, for her anyway, it was far preferable to being on Revlimid maintenance or on, you know, cyclical chemotherapy every week with the Cyborg D and then with the Velcade maintenance. So, um, so I think it, you know, if it does prove to be the case that we, we, we can determine how best to use it, it could be a game changer and it could be much preferable to the existing approaches. And you are pretty positive about that this possibility exists, huh? Well, yeah, that. I am, but you got that <laughs> that health warning on, on that statement that I'm the person who developed the measles virus in the first place. <laughs> yes, you might be a little biased, but we're excited that you are. Yeah, okay. Guys. We we have time for one more caller question. So um, 9836757, please go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, Dr. Russell and Dr. Van Ray. This is Dana Holmes. I really appreciated hearing your ultimate goal, that being we want to see another Stacy and another Stacy. Um, can't agree with you more. Stacy is a member in our online support group, and we have been cheering her on. Um, it's really just such a, a unique opportunity to have her in our group, and, and as patients, we can actually see and hear how she's doing. Um, a question. If successful, if this treatment is successful in the relapse stage, the uh, high-risk stage, the, um, I guess, the aggressive stage, do you see moving this approach into newly diagnosed myeloma patients who are treatment naive, those who perhaps at the early stage of myeloma, have a lower, t lower tumor burden and have a less aggressive mutated level stage of the disease? Or is it too think, toxic well, for someone like that? Well, that is actually probably one of the good things about this therapy that the studies that Dr. Russell and, and his colleagues have done uh, at the Mayo Clinic shows that the therapy so far has proven uh, quite safe and non-toxic. Um, and Dr. Russell made a very important point is um, that uh, patients require prolonged therapy at this moment in time. In Arkansas, we use the dreaded total therapy approach, which means two cycles of chemo, two transplants, two further cycles of chemo, and three years maintenance, which is an enormous amount of treatment. The results yes. are very, very good. But um, if you actually could achieve the same with an, a very limited uh, uh, treatment approach up front, um, I think that would be truly exciting and truly uh, uh, innovate, innovating. Um, obviously, um, we hope that virotherapy can uh, can achieve this, and we're uh, Dr. Russell is. Uh, obviously pursuing multiple avenues to try and get this therapy as, as effective uh, as possible, and maybe Dr. Russell would like to expand on this. Well, Thank on the, you, on the toxicity front, um, I think it would be, uh, at least on what we know, uh, remember at the moment we, we, we're we early stage, so you know our, the information we have about toxicity is somewhat limited, but generally what we see is that... Um, during the infusion, there may be a headache. In fact, Stacy got a pretty bad headache. The infusion was stopped. She had some Benadryl, and the infusion was restarted. And most patients don't get the headache, but sometimes they do. Post-infusion, everything's quiet for an hour, 
two hours, sometimes four hours, and then the um, shaking begins, the rigors, as the temperature increases. And so body temperature goes up typically to around about 40 degrees um, by late afternoon on the day of the infusion. And there may be some vomiting. Um, you know, we haven't reached the point yet where we preempt that. And we give therapy to prevent it. Um, we almost like to see it because then we know the patient has actually received the virus. Yeah, have, and having a and, response to it. Mm -hmm. And then overnight, the, um, the fever typically resolves. And so by the morning, the temperature's back down to the normal level, and it may bounce up and down a little for the next week or so. But it's really that early, you know, you certainly know when you've been infused with this um, treatment. But that, you know, I think it, it's manageable and it's, uh, it, it's um, acceptable toxicity provided this uh, ends up being an effective therapy. So we could envisage bringing it as, in as frontline um, treatment for myeloma if we really do, um, you know, iron out all the issues with how best to use it. Hypothetically, Dr. Russell, if you did iron them all out, let's say within that two-year time frame, would you move into the newly diagnosed patient right away, or would you continue to test it in that relapse setting just to more or less validate it and, and test it further? Well, that is a question that I have not really thought through. Um, I think it's you, you're, you're now getting into the territory of um, what is the best drug development path in order to get FDA approval um, of a new drug for the treatment of myeloma patients. And it seems that very often um, the best approach is to demonstrate that it's beneficial in patients who do not have other treatment options because then FDA will ultimately say, okay, we approve. And it's typically after that's happened that drugs are used earlier and earlier in the course of the disease. So I don't know. I don't know whether that would be different for a drug like this. Um, but I think we'll cross that bridge. We hope to cross that bridge when we when we get there. Well, thank you, Dr. Russell. I'm actually a smoldering patient, so I have time to wait, and I'll walk that bridge with you. <laughs> Hopefully someday. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you both very much for taking the call. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for your question. Well, doctors, we are so happy to have you on. This is such an exciting um, project, and we love that you're collaborating. We love that you're making refinements and changes along the way as you learn more, and I think that's just part of the whole process. Um, we just... We're excited that you're looking at something that could be applicable for all myeloma patients and um, are just very grateful for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you very you much, and, and thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to um, appear on the show and discuss the, um, the myeloma v um, virotherapy approach. Absolutely well, second that. Thank you very much. We are learning so much from you, so thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners for listening to Maloma Crowd Radio and the new MCRI series. We believe that patients can help support the discovery of a cure, and we encourage you to become involved. Family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.